All right, Victor from Worldwide with us yet again. This time, Secrets of a Successful Farm. Uh, this is valuable to me because I tried to do a farm in my basement and failed. Did you? Uh, well, it was like 18 years ago, yes, but I don't know why. Uh, but I was growing fishing or corals in my tank like wildfire. And I'm like, man, this is like seems like printing money. Why don't I do it down in my basement? And I now know some what mistakes I did. Uh, but. Uh, the secrets, you don't have to learn the way that I did. We can learn a little bit of this today. Uh, both, some of this applies to like a commercial size system and some of it applies to even if I wanted to do it just in my basement. Uh, but the first one, secret of a successful farm, what is it? It's the right team with the right experience, bunch of veterans we have, you know. Mm -hmm. um, any of you guys that have been in the hobby long enough, if you've been to Worldwide Corals, you know some of the people that work for us. Uh, it's there's, there's plenty of them. They've been in the industry for a long time, you know. Alex, Chris Tornier, uh, we got Frank, we got we got Matt, uh, we got many of them, you know. We got Brent, JW. Um, we started recruiting all of these people about six, seven years ago. We realized that if we wanted to grow bigger and just keep on doing what we we did in a much larger scale version of what you just said, mm -hmm. we needed to just to get uh, experts on board, you know, and we done a great job on building the team. You were just mentioning earlier, we got the all-star team over there. And once you have the right team with the right experience, you're able to share knowledge with each other and we're able to learn much faster and just get to, to the point much faster, you know? You know, actually, I left your facility that first time and I came back and I'm like, guys, I know why those tanks look awesome and a couple of them here don't. Uh, is uh, By here, I mean back in Minnesota. Yeah. Uh, it's because there's people full time taking care of these tanks. Their sole function uh, and job uh, there yeah. is to take care of these animals. And at BRS, we try to fit it in, you know? Yeah. Uh, like 160, we get all of our time. A uh, handful of tanks all here. Some of the other ones, not so much. So the difference there is somebody is caring for these things and they know what they're doing. Yes. Uh, so I think that's true of uh, a lot of, uh, you know, farms and fish stores, to be frank is if you walk in one that's filled with people like the uh, you guys have hired, essentially the dream team, well, all of the tanks will look awesome. It'll look spectacular yeah. in there because somebody's caring for them. If you walk into another one where they turn over employees every single six months or every three months. Yeah, and no one seems to know what they're doing. Yeah, and you're never, not willing to pay them like professionals or, you know, that take care of these animals, well, the tanks look like crap. Yeah, you will see the I results. Mean, like, I don't need even need to interview the employee or know who it is. I can look at the tanks and know how good they are. Yeah, you know? of course. Uh, so I think that's an important one is like, if you ever want to do this, A, you're going to have to either have uh, the successful experience yourself on doing it, or make sure, man, look for the best in town. And uh, because that person that's the best in town will help you succeed uh, uh, the same way that helped you guys succeed. Yeah. Next one, number two. Number two, keep the wild corals separate from aquaculture corals. Keep them mm -hmm. completely separate in two different areas. Um, what's happening is um, wild corals, um, when they come in, they come in pretty dirty, not just with parasites, but they come in, they're stressed. They got a lot of sponges that they're dying. They got a lot of undesirable animals, a pistol shrimp, mantis shrimps, uh, bristle worms, you name it. And when you don't keep the two separate, you're never going to get ahead. Um, you're always going to be catching parasites on the corals that you're already growing aquaculture. So therefore, when you set up a farm, no matter how small or how big it is, you have to plan on, on, on having them completely separate. Another problem, if you keep them both in one room, even though you say the left side is aquaculture and the right side is wild, you have to keep them uh, separate. If you've ever been to our farm, our aquaculture side has got three little gates that you have to go through them. And it's, done, it's, it's helping us to, where the employees know that if they're opening a gate, they don't go back there. They know better, you know? So I think it's very important to keep the two areas very separate just so you don't spread these parasites around. All right, another one, actually, it's closely related to that. Number three, secrets of a successful farm, parasite knowledge. Oh my gosh. So when you think, when, when, when you have a large farm like we do and you do export a percentage of your corals on a regular basis, when these corals come in from the wild, um, you find a lot of parasites that people don't even talk about and we're constantly um, trying to discover ways of fighting them. Um, for instance, examples, um, spiders on Goniopores. You ever heard of that? Mm, 
Uh, spiders and guns, no, I haven't. It's like a little spider, you just eat in the Goniopora. Mm. You ever seen a, so you ever, Same thing, but in a Goniopora. Mm -hmm. So every time that you think you've seen it all, you haven't. You always find something new, and a lot of times you don't even know what it is. We had actually an acro tank here that was Jason's, one of the nicest tanks we ever had here, and it just went totally to hell with one coral addition, and it was some kind of tiny little microscopic black bug. Uh, and nothing could stop it. We could not figure it out, uh, and it wiped out the entire tank. Let's find out how to dip some of this stuff because we can prevent it from entering the farm. They never have to deal with it yeah. as well. Next one, uh, number four. Maintaining equipment can hope and pray. So when you have a 100-gallon tank at home with two power heads, a couple of lights, and a protein skimmer, you don't do any maintenance equipment until it kind of like stop working or it's just making a weird noise. Uh, when you have a farm and you have three, four hundred lights, over four hundred power heads, twenty calcium reactors, fifty UVs, we have a person actually that goes around the farm just maintaining this equipment on a schedule. Mm -hmm. If we don't do that, then the equipment wouldn't work properly and we wouldn't be able to have a successful farm. Why do I say that? When you have twenty calcium reactors and you're not checking them on a schedule, you might be farming and you get to that one system and you can't wait for the corals to look bad. So you have to be on top of your equipment all the time. That's what we mean by that. So maintaining the equipment, yeah, like not, not a, just waiting for it to break. No, put it this way. The radions, uh, I think every two months they go out and they take the fan out and they blow with a little air with a mm -hmm. compressor mm -hmm. just so the fan doesn't burn out and the light doesn't burn out. And before we did that, when you have three, four hundred lights, we're pulling three or four a month. Doesn't seem like a lot, but when you go a few months and you got to pull 12 lights, now no lights. So the maintenance is very important. Uh, another one is temp control and humidity, successful farm. All right, so when we build this, we're on the third farm, by the way. This is the, this is the third one, which is the one that we're in now. Uh, it's about 5,000 square feet. And when we designed the entire farm, um, there was a lot of calculations in, uh, in the HC bag, one of the main things that they asked us was to put, um, in the farm we put, I think, 25 tons of AC and they put two giant dehumidifiers, mm -hmm. which it was great. It kept the temperature at about 74 degrees. There's no humidity, but the tanks were too cold by just taking all the humidity out. Mm. So then we have to put heaters on top of it. And if you don't put the heater, if you take the dehumidifier, then the room is too humid. Mm -hmm. So a big part of uh, having um, a successful farm is just to keep in the temperature and humidity and the control is so important. Another piece though that you shared that I think a lot, we try to bring home, but a lot of people miss. And I, actually I picked up something here that I didn't yeah. th I think about is a lot of people think of the temperature control in your tank as your tank heater, right? In reality, the temperature control is the room that it's in. Yes. How hot the room is in, the heater is actually just finite control past that. Yeah. Right? What I didn't think about is uh, humidity. And so, uh, it's huge. how humidity controls evaporation, and the more evaporation you have, uh, the more, uh, uh, the lower the temp will be. Number six, other successful component of a farm, seen this? Leak detectors. They sound pretty simple, but when we have over 60 separate systems between the retail and the farm, mm -hmm. and we don't have a lot of leaks, but there's always, when you got that many systems, something can happen, and we got the systems designed pretty well. So when you do have a leak, you need to know, and you need to know fast. Mm -hmm. uh, it can cause a fire, it can cause things to break, it can cause animals to die. You can have major losses. So I think it's very important just to have a successful farm, just to have leak detectors throughout the facility. So a leak could be anything from like a split a seam, uh, it could be a plumbing leak. A fish a getting caught in a drain and the tank doesn't no longer drains. And it, it could be uh, protein skimmers going crazy. Yeah, know, and it's, and it's not just the leak, the water that makes it to the floor, we need to know. Because if it's a fish that it covered the overflow, now the water is coming out from the top. Once the sump runs dry, now you got a pump running with no water, and that can be a cause of fire. So it's just salinity changes. What if it's just going down the drain? That is huge. Actually, you know, you know <laughs> what? the mother of all leaks. At one point, we had a <laughs> go for uh, it, Ryan. I'm ready. <laughs> we had a big giant, one of those big giant white tubs you can put live rock in. Uh, they're like they're like the size of a pallet and okay. yay tall. Uh, we we're gonna sell live rock here, 
right? And we put a big giant skimmer on it and everything. Uh, and then nobody bought it. Like people just didn't want to buy live rock. Uh, and it was and like the, the freshest stench. stuff you could find, right? Uh, but they wanted to buy dry rock from it. So I just okay. sat there. And then one day I went back there and like, hey, the protein skimmer isn't running. It's just kind of like, there's no air in this thing. There's air's going, but the bubbles isn't making foam. And I tested the water and it was fresh water now. And I'm like, what happened? Well, how did it go from salt water, water to fresh water? 100% changeover from fresh salt oh. to fresh. Because there was a tiny little leak in the bottom of this uh, uh, white bin. And you guys kept opening it off. And I had the top off in it. And you know, who knows how long it took, right? For uh, the whole the swap. Turnover to 100%, uh, I mean, there's probably a thousand <laughs> gallons in this thing. So you and see it, how important it is? What if you had a bunch of rare stuff and then you don't realize it until later? The well, leak would have told you something leak and go check it. One of the reasons though that we didn't notice is because there was a crack in the cement below it. And so the water actually went down the crack in the cement. And it must have been 100,000 gallons, man, that went down there, uh, dilute to zero. Right? Uh, wow. There must be like a giant sinkhole underneath there that just collected <laughs> all this water. But you would never know, you know, unless the, uh, uh, you have some kind of leak uh, uh, or sensor. I think the same thing at home. Like, people, like, you tend to only solve the problems that you've already had. It doesn't matter how many times everybody else has had this problem. Uh, so if you had a leak, you'd go buy a leak sensor. Or you can just accept that, hey man, I got a big glass box of water here. It's got tons of plumbing. It's got a bunch of things that go wrong. And I can just plug a, like a leak sensor. And it could be like a leak sensor you plug into your Apex, or it could be like that watchdog thing you get from uh, Home Depot, which is like you know, 12 bucks. And it just sets off an audible alarm that says, hey man, like you're making a mess here. Your wood floors are gonna be uh, destroyed. Yeah. Your uh, drywall and the ceiling below this tank is gonna get destroyed. So it's gonna yeah. save you a lot of money. Yeah, and like for 12 bucks. Yeah, who wouldn't do that? Yeah. Uh, better if my phone tells me, hey man, go save your tank uh, from somewhere else. But yeah. at least if I'm home, I'm home a Something. lot. Something, yeah. You know? uh, all right, the next one here, number seven. Uh, successful farm is to have large mother colonies that can grow faster. If you got a little Montipora, it's only this big. By the time you get a couple of frags, you might get five, six frags around. And then when you frag the coral, the coral gets stressed. So it's going to stop growing for the next two to four weeks or so. Now, if you have a coral that is the size of my chest here, you can cut 30 frags out of this side. You're not uh, hitting the other side. It's just more surface area to be able to farm. You're able to trim the coral versus just kind of like chopping it down. Mother coral, like big colonies, just grow way faster and like look by, by scale. Look at the, um, the mycetium, look mm -hmm. at the lamellosa, look at the bird nest. Mm -hmm. You can get frags out of those things, and I don't think you're going to slow down the growth if you cut only a few from the edge, you know, because they're just so big. I mean, like, if you, a lot of people will try to grow, like, one little frag into another and then break it off and sell it. If only you would just hold on to it so it's about yay Long big. Long enough, you uh, will produce plenty. Yeah, it, then it becomes a sustainable thing. It also actually looks good in your tank <laughs> as well. You know what? One example that I always use, check this out. Bounce mushroom is a coral that everyone wants, and the minute that you get a piece, it sells automatically, right? So recently, I just talked to uh, my farmers in the shop, and we have maybe two or three of them. I said, look, guys, why don't we have more? Well, because every time we make one, it sells. I said, okay. No more for sale. So we went from three to six, six to 12. Now we're working on the 12 to 24. So my goal is we let it get big enough. Now if I got 24, I can say, hey guys, sell six of them. Now you got 18, cut those 18 and a half. Now you got 36. So you got to get the coral big enough if you want to produce. Or like you say, you, you buy one, it grows into two, you sell the other one. Mm -hmm. You're never going to have a production of the coral. So that's why it's important to let the corals turn into a colony before you keep on selling them. If you do it if right. If you want to be a successful farmer. If you do it right, too, you'll reduce the demand for uh, wild caught versions of that stuff as well. Exactly. The next one here is actually number eight. Having enough options. What do we mean by that? Uh, enough selection of corals. Yeah, because if you're going to be a farmer that only sells two things, it gets all quick. Uh, you need to keep your conveyor oven full. What happened is, as much as we want to think that we have a timeline how the scrolls grow, it's not like the oranges. You know, you know you're going to get a batch every so often. Mm -hmm. There's too many variables on corals. And sometimes you might be able to grow a good batch of agros every three months. But then the third batch might just something happen and 
the coils bleached for some reason. The heater broke like we were talking about earlier. So now you don't have that batch of acres that everybody was waiting, but you can say, you know what? We got these other 50 options here that we've been working on. So you're able to release corals at a different times versus just saying, hey, we only have 10, 20 different species. And after being in business for 10, 20 years, you might become a company somewhat irrelevant if you cannot produce new corals, you know? There's a bunch of uh, uh, kind of old school propagation facilities out there that like have that same problem. Uh, some of them do it in outdoors and like, Sometimes it's just too hot. There's too much sun and they all browned out and they don't look good and they won't look good until winter. And, but they have other things that did well during that period of time, but also haven't added anything new in ages. And so yeah. like as a hobbyist, like uh, kind of bored here. I'd like, I'd like something new. So it's excitement. Yeah. Farmer, you got to keep it fresh, keep it new, find new things, but new things, not just like to keep reefers happy, but because some things will always not do always good. Exactly. Know? Exactly. So having a large um, amount of options, different colonies, different um, species is very important. Another one, almost the same thing is actually number one with the right team, but secrets of a successful farm. Chemistry owner, right? So like somebody that in the facility, this is my job. Yes. So at our facility, her name is Natalie. She's been with us for about a year and a half. And she started on the shipping department and she moved into uh, water chemistry. She's doing a heck of a job. It is full time. Uh, it's, it's so important for us to have that person doing it pretty much five days a week full time. Uh, without her, we, don't, we can monitor the tanks the right way. And it's very important that the person takes their job very serious and then not just put in any numbers, you know, because they could lie to us. They could be like, oh. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I, I can emphasize how important that is just to understand where your tanks are at all times. You know, that leads right actually into number 10, which is one of the things that I learned from you guys too the first time I was there, which is checklists and clear duties, right? So it's not good enough to say, hey, I'd like, hopefully all this stuff gets done every day. Like, no, man, there has to be a list of things that I know for sure every day was done. And uh, your team showed me, like, you can go up to the wall and as a, you know, the owner of the business, I can just look and grab the, the clipboard off the board and I could actually know that all these tanks are okay without reading any of this because I know that somebody filled all of it in, which means that they did the work and they're taking care of it. Yes. Just because it's filled out. Yeah, it is so important, you know, to have ch checklists. And like I was mentioning earlier, we have um, over 60 bodies of water just on the farm. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have this checklist, things can go wrong very, very quick just by forgetting to feed an animal or forgetting to move a coral that is stinging another one or, or the light is stuck. You know, sometimes you come in at six in the morning and there's a tank with all the lights blasting at a hundred percent, you know? So then immediately you go into your checklist. Hey, make sure you put on the checklist that the IT person is to check why the lights were staying on, you know? So that's part of the checklist and all the duties that they have every day they show up to the facility. This is another one that applies to home though. What uh, is the checklist, uh, because like I could change out my UV bulb and I know I need to change it out every nine to 12 months, but I have a horrible memory. I don't remember the last time I did it, you know, and uh, like I won't remember on time and it will just like kind of fade and like, who knows, it may be 18 months before I change this. Yeah, and, and we have to do it by, by calendar because you can't change all the UVs at the same time, it's too mm -hmm. many. Mm -hmm. So this week you're doing these four UVs, these two calcium reactors and these 20 lights and these two return pumps. Mm -hmm. Next week you move to the next section, you know, cause it's just too much to do them all at once. So like, uh, you know, I always, you know, cause we use it here, the, the Neptune thing has like the little tasks in there. Like I can say, I changed the UV here, remind me again to do it in nine months. But there's also like free uh, apps, like in, you know, Android or Apple or, I think maybe one's called Aqua Notes or something, but uh, you can like literally put it in there. Like, hey, remind me to do these things every single month. Uh, remind me to do these things every six months. Remind me to do these things every year. Oh, they got and their own little sheet. There's yeah. a book that they have. They have to follow to the T. Is this that much? It really is. Yeah, I think in the in a commercial facility, clipboard is the right way to go. Yeah, and that application, I don't think will handle that many systems. No, <laughs> no. But at home, like, how can we take that lesson at home? That's why those tanks are stable and they stay up. Uh, how do we keep those things up? And a quick little app on your phone can be a great solution. Yep. Uh, next one here. Uh, this one's interesting. I don't know why anybody would do this, but I guarantee they do because they'd like a few bucks. Uh, number 11, 
secrets to a successful farm, don't do what? Fragging the corals only when they're happy. Do yeah. not frag them when they're not happy. So uh, too many people made the mistake that they see a dollar sign into these corals and they see a coral and they just, here's an acupora and they see these five frags, they caught all five of them and they leave a base. They don't understand that if you caught all five and you leave that base, that doesn't mean the coral is gonna die. But you, you stress the coral out so much that the coral has got to go to a period of time where he's refining himself to grow again, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're much better just doing some trimming, just a few branches that you're, when if this was the acupora, you're better just cutting a little tip here and a little tip there. Um, too many people are just chasing money and they don't, not, they don't understand that it's a trimming thing, not a chopping thing. You, don't chop it down. <coughs> You should, when the, the, it's going to survive having uh, essentially limbs cut off of it, yes. when it's healthy, right? When it looks like at its best is when it's most likely to survive, you know, uh, cutting off little clippings off of it. So uh, I don't know, I mean, I understand the mentality of, hey, I would like to uh, trade this coral or sell that coral or whatever, but like, just don't. You know, wait until that thing's healthy and you'll be way more successful. In the end, you'll have a lot more of them to sell. Yeah. Uh, and uh, number 12, uh, secrets of a successful farm. I threw this one in here because I saw it when I was there, which is when you put the farm and retail together, right? Because in this facility at Worldwide, half of the, uh, the building is a farm, right? The other half of the building is the retail store, which means that when the <coughs> coral's done being farmed and it's fragged, it transport is 14 feet that direction, yeah. right? Uh, and uh, cared for by the exact same people almost. Yeah. Uh, there is a high likelihood that that coral is going to survive that. And then when I go pick it up in the store, it's going to uh, go well to my tank. And then also in the back of the farm, is the e-commerce facility yes. where they actually ship these to your house as well. So when you mix the farm and the retail together, what you're really doing is reducing all of the handling and transport and stress to the animal. And like, I'll be straight. When I first saw it, I didn't understand why you would put a farm in some of the most expensive retail facility there. Uh, I mean, it's in this really cool strip mall. I know. Right? <clears throat> I understand why the retail facility is there, but yeah. why would you spend the farm? But now I look at it, it's because it's best for the animal and what's best for the animal is almost certainly best for the business. Yeah, I mean, we, we thought about that on the beginning. Uh, if you remember, you seen our farm before this one. Mm -hmm. It was about five miles on the road. That's the one that we sold to um, SeaWorld and Disney and Fish and Wildlife to rescue the, the corals and the keys. Mm -hmm. um, we were gonna keep the farm, but then we realized that we're better paying extra dollar for the space that we're renting and have everything under one roof and be able to operate more efficiently mm -hmm. than just going back and forth with these animals and just going to different facilities, bringing coolers, loading them into the coolers, getting them out of the coolers. And we experienced that before because the, the farm that I told you that we saw before it used to be two miles from the old store. And those two miles back and forth for that one year and a half, year and a half that we did, it was, it was pretty painful. And yeah. we chose to put it all in one roof and we thought it was gonna be big enough, but we outgrew it, so we're thinking into the next one already. That is how it goes. Uh, that actually brings up an interesting point because a lot of like, you know, your retail store, uh, in, most, in many cases, wouldn't have a farm on site, which means you'd order from a different farm in a different state, it would have to go through FedEx or uh, airline cargo or whatever yeah. it would be. And you're saying like, I didn't even like it driving it five miles down the street. You know, it, yeah. it's just better to farm it on site and have it move 14 feet to the left. Yeah, it's uh, much better, less stress for the coral. Uh, our, oh, this one is actually interesting. I think a lot of people will be, uh, be happy to hear this one. Uh, secrets of a successful farm, number 13. Reliable, using a reliable saw. We use a lot of it, Has always has to be good. Uh, there's a lot of good brands of salt out there. Uh, we've been using uh, Brywell for many, many years now. Uh, it's been a stable salt, easy to dissolve. We do water changes on most of the system weekly, so it's important that when we get this batch of salt, it's able to do uh, dissolve the correct way. There's other brands that we use in the past that they've been stable for a while, and after a year or randomly, there's a batch that is different. It doesn't dissolve the right way. 
And that's what we stuck around with uh, Brightwell. We've just been happy with them. I said that you were going to like this because sometimes you like alternative to Brightwell is... Instant Ocean. Yeah, I mean, like the cheapest option out there. Instant right? Ocean is a great <laughs> saw. We have no issues with them. Okay, I, I'm going to tell you this. As a, a person that have seen the behind the scenes at some of these manufacturers, uh, like if you want, this actually probably applies to home, but definitely if you're running a business, is reliable salt because in your case, you're doing massive water changes because yeah. every single coral you sell has a bag of water that came out of that system. Yes, right? and so we're shipping that water. You're yeah. turning over salt all the time. If you got a bad batch of salt, I mean, God forbid, right? I mean, you could put the whole operation at risk, right? Yeah. So reliability counts. Uh, and so I will tell you, the older, more established ones that have the robust systems behind it and capable of scaling up and down yeah. uh, tend to be the most reliable. The flashes in the pan, the newest, hottest thing almost never has a reliability. And I'm even going to go all the way to my favorite, which is Tropic Marin. So Tropic Marin, when we were able to clearly demonstrate this doesn't have garbage in it, and we showed it in a bunch of experiments, it's clean, keeps your bins clean. It's a great salt. Yeah. The demand for it skyrocketed to the point that they couldn't keep up with demand and opened up the turkey plant. Oh, wow. The turkey plant didn't have uh, the same standards in the end. Oof. Uh, yeah, and so then it started getting some brown garbage in it. Then the brown garbage, when you're used to crystal clear, it was like, ah, what is it? The reality is the turkey plant actually just felled the same standards as every, all the other dirty salts out there. But like it was a good example because I've seen this many, many times with a lot of different salts, which is the older established ones tend to be really, really stable. stable. Yeah. All right. Secrets to a successful farm. There's a bunch of in there, things in there. But the next one up is actually... Uh, what do we got here? We have the 10 things that the hobby should stop doing. That one is coming up next.